All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming to the Planting for Pollinators online workshop. Um, we really appreciate you guys being flexible and um, we know that everyone is just really a craving human contact, even if it's digital. So um, this is fun for us too. And we're glad that we're able to hang out with you and talk about pollinators. Um, also, I will be I'm also playing host right now, so letting people in. So there's gonna be some slight technical difficulties, but we just hope you'll hang in there with us. And um, if you're having any difficulties hearing me right now, um, make sure you can go in the chat box and Angie can help you with that. I realize you can't hear me. You probably didn't hear what I just said. I really said that. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose um, I could post some things in the chat feature too. I know when I first logged on, I hadn't joined the audio and so I couldn't hear Lauren yet. So that could be a problem of yours. All right. Well, I'm going to quick let John introduce himself. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm John. I'm the Director of Education and Blue Thumb Programs at Metro Blooms. Um, and I'm going to be here today to talk about lawns to legumes and among a variety of other things. And I am Lauren Hayden Dries. I am a water resources educator and BMP designer for the Washington Conservation District. And I'm here to talk to you guys about all things pollinators and way to support them in your yard. Um, lawn Selegumes uh, is, uh, and we're going to get into this, is a program that's administered and run by the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources. We're going to say that, uh, we're going to refer to them quite a bit in this presentation, uh, but at least I'm always going to call them Bowser, B-W-S-R. So when I say Bowser, I'm not talking about a, um, you know, a Game Boy character, I'm talking about uh, the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources. They're a state agency meant to uh, help private landowners enhance conservation practices on their land. Um, uh, Bowser has contracted with Blue Thumb to help run some of the lawns to legumes programs, including parts of these workshops. Um, uh, and Blue Thumb is a public-private partnership that shares the goal of helping uh, property owners and residents um, reduce runoff and improve water quality by installing uh, native plants and other uh, best management practices uh, on their land. Uh, one of our Blue Thumb partners is uh, Washington Conservation District. That's me. Um, so the Washington Conservation District is a local unit of government in Washington County. We are a traditional soil and water conservation district. Um, and the role of a soil and water conservation district is to manage and direct natural resources, both in urban and rural settings, and specifically working with private landowners, which is something that a lot of the other um, local units of government aren't doing in regards to natural resources. So considering that privately owned lands make up almost 78% in Minnesota, that's a really key, key niche that we're able to fill to work on these private lands and focus on egg, forestry and water quality and habitat like we're gonna be talking about today. So some of the key services that we provide are free site visits to landowners in Washington County. Um, so site visits, we can help you focus on water quality improvement, habitat restoration, invasive species. We also help landowners apply for grants as a form of incentive or to help them offset the cost of implementing these conservation practices. We'll kind of get into that later. And then we also host workshops throughout the year like this one not usually online, but now they are, and they're really on anything from native landscaping to wetlands to invasive species, and Angie's done tons of um, really fun like outdoor family activities like pond dipping. Um, so yeah, definitely stay in tune with our calendar. And let's see, I was just gonna touch on a few housekeeping notes that during the presentation, um, we just really appreciate it if you keep your microphones muted. Um, Ideally, the webcams too, it just keeps a little less clutter up the screen. Um, we'll have opportunities throughout the presentations to ask questions where if people want to unmute and ask questions, that's great. If not, you can use the chat box and Angie will kind of help direct those questions to us. Um, if you have trouble finding that, again, 
um, you can go to the top of your screen, kind of hover over those controls, and you should be able to find your chat box there. And then lastly, we just don't want anyone to panic. We're going to be mentioning a lot of different resources throughout this. Um, the presentation will be posted afterwards, and we will be sending out an email with a bunch of the really helpful links to resources that John and I will be covering. So don't take too many furious notes. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to pass it back over to John to introduce lawns to legumes. Okay. Um, yeah, so the uh, whole kind of structure of this workshop is going to, we're going to split it into three parts. Um, going to introduce the Lawns to Legumes program and what you can use uh, from it and how it can help. Um, we're going to talk about some challenges that our uh, friend, the Rossi Patch Bumblebee and um, other wildlife in Minnesota um, are facing, our ecosystems, and what we can do to address them. And then we'll get to the really fun part. We'll spend most of the time on how we can create pollinator habitat in our yards. Um, so uh, Lawns to Legumes um, is a statewide program run by the aforementioned Bowser um, and in part implemented by Blue Thumb with a goal of protecting the Rusty Patch bumblebee. Um, uh, the main way they intend to do this is to help uh, Minnesota residents uh, create and maintain high quality pollinator habitat on residential lands throughout the state. Um, they're gonna do that uh, partly through um, uh, cost share reimbursements of uh, you know, directly reimbursing some Minnesotans for uh, converting part of their lawn to pollinator habitat, um, and then also through the um, education programs, educational resources that they've been producing um, to kind of help more folks know what they can do and how to get involved. Um, our new state bee, if you haven't met them yet, uh, is Bombus affinis, the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, uh, in May, of last year, uh, Minnesota named it our new state bee. You generally don't get a state bee unless something bad is happening to them. Um, in our case, Bombus affinis is the first federally endangered uh, bumblebee in the continental U.S. Um, so, uh, in order to help it, we need to know what it needs. Um, and uh, so a little bit about the rusty patch. Um, it nests in the soil. Um, it's not too picky. Um, loose, uh, sandy soil is nice. It can dig a little burrow. It's also opportunistic and will use an abandoned rodent's nest to build a colony there. Um, and then it relies on blooming native flowers throughout the growing season. If you're not sick, of us saying staggered bloom times by the end of this presentation. We probably haven't said it enough, but the rusty patch is active from April to October and it relies on pollen and nectar from flowers throughout that time. Um, part of uh, where those flowers need to be are in uh, connected high quality habitat so that uh, one bee can access enough uh, forage material in order to support um, the colony that it's a part of um, and uh, build the well, queen starts in the spring and uh, kind of builds a hive as she goes, um, builds the rest of the colony. So she needs a lot of habitat in order to do that. Um, it doesn't have to be in one yard, but that yard has to be close to other yards with connected high quality poll pollinator habitat. Um, and then lastly, uh, we need to protect our uh, threatened endangered pollinators from uh, insecticides and fungicides. Um, many chemicals that uh, we might use on our lawns or on um, ornamental plantings um, have adverse effects on wildlife. Um, I'm sure by now most of you have heard about the systemic insecticide neonicotinoid. Um, and uh, that, has, that can kill uh, the rusty patch and all other pollinators. It can also have sublethal impacts that disorient them, 
uh, reduce their stamina and ability to really do their jobs. Um, and so limiting any kind of uh, insecticides uh, important. Um, so uh, the lawn selection program, as I said, uh, includes a cost share for installing pollinator habitat. Uh, you can access that through an application. Currently there are uh, over 7,000 applications in for our second round of funding. Um, in total, uh, we plan to fund a thousand Minnesota residents uh, with this funding. So um, not everyone who applies is going to get it. Um, that's why we hope these educational resources can help uh, uh, people who might not get the grant still know how to do something in their yards. Um, if you look at the map here um, on the right of the screen, um, you see Minnesota and in three different shades of green or yellow. Um, this darkest green is the highest priority areas. This is um, in and around the areas where the rusty patch bumblebee has been detected. And that's where Bowser wants to prioritize uh, their funding and outreach. Um, the uh, kind of intermediate uh, lime-ish green is the secondary priority areas. Um, those are kind of abutting the um, priority areas uh, most times and also uh, just other good quality habitat um, that Bowser wanted to prioritize. And the lightest green or yellow um, you see is uh, the, the lowest priority area, which doesn't mean we uh, you know, don't want to get projects in the ground there. Um, but it's just the least promising to see the rusty patch here anytime soon. Um, you might notice Washington County over here on the right is almost completely within the solid green highest priority area, which means that you, uh, any Washington County resident has a higher chance of receiving uh, the application funding. Um, other, uh, Besides the uh, uh, cost share funding, as I've mentioned, you know, we're doing workshops. We have um, uh, educational resources that we'll touch on and share with you. Um, and then also uh, finding ways to coach people and kind of help walk them through the process of what it means to build pollinator habitat. Um, this, these are some of the great guides that Bowser has put together. This planting for pollinators is 36 or so beautiful pages of that walks through different project types and um, how to install them and uh, you know even kind of plant lists to consider for different site requirements. Um, it is a phenomenal resource. Um, over on the right uh, is a little planting template uh, which we can uh, look into in a little more depth. Uh, because uh, working with native plants can, can be intimidating, um, these templates are designed to be pretty simple and include just, you know, 10 plants in a garden um, with staggered bloom times. Um, say it with me, folks, staggered bloom times. Uh, and, uh, there, on the back of the sheet, when you see it, um, there are substitutions for the plants. If you know you can't find Joe Pie weed, there's ten other plants that um, could functionally fill its role. Um, these are just some of the resources that are available to you and that you can use when um, planting uh, pollinator habitat in your yard. Now, the uh, kind of first question that we've uh, been asked a lot uh, when we start talking about lawns to legumes is, what is a legume? Uh, literally, it's just anything in the pea family. Um, they're flowering plants, fix nitrogen in the soil. Um, some recognizable species include Dutch white clover. Um, and then other kind of of our favorite native species include purple prairie clover, milk vetch, and lead plant. Um, why is the program called Lawns to Legumes? Our best guess is that um, uh, politicians like alliteration. Um, so that's what the program 
you know, started off as, and that's what it is. Now, are you only allowed to put legumes in your yard? The answer to that is no. The purpose of the program is to get pollinator habitat in your yard, and that definitely includes native, uh, native flowers that are not legumes, uh, some of which we've pictured here. Um, the, I just want to emphasize that so people know uh, you don't have to use just legumes. Um, these are some of the Rusty Patch's favorite plants. Um, wild bergamot uh, is uh, often noted as the plant that um, the Rusty Patch gets cited on um, and scientists believe it offers uh, not only high quality nectar and pollen, but um, uh, immune building capacities for the bees um, that help them fight uh, some of the threats that they're facing in the world they're living in today. Um, that blooms kind of summer towards, towards the late end. Uh, goldenrod's a wonderful fall bloomer. Um, and we have columbine and Virginia bluebells that bloom earlier in the year because stagger bloom times are important. All right, so that is uh, lawns to legumes in a nutshell. Uh, if you have questions about um, the program, the application, uh, what uh, those funds could be used for, now is your time to ask. Now is a time to ask. Okay, I see a question from Laura Crandall uh, speaking about how grant recipients are selected. That's a great question. Um, that map that I showed earlier um, with the priority areas, um, that is the main uh, kind of way that Bowser is weighting applications. Um, at the end of the day, it's pretty much a giant lottery of everyone who's applied. Um, but if you're within the dark green area, you are, you know, weighted heavier, um, as well as Bowser's um, working to make sure that um, geographic and equitable distribution occurs. Um, so those are kind of the fun, but um, the application itself is really simple. We're not, you know, weighting, um, different scores that you, according to how you answer it or anything. Hey, John, I see this question about, is there a book to buy? And there is not necessarily a book to buy, but I did actually bring along two copies of, can everybody see if I hold it at just the right place? Um, Heather Holm is a local author and she has two really great books. One is Pollinators of Native Plants. And it will have these really awesome pages where it just shows pictures of all the different bees that she found that would land on different kinds of flowers. And then she followed it up with another book. Let's see, I'm trying to get it centered right in the screen. Bees, an identification and native plant forage guide. And that also has really great big, huge, pretty pictures of different kinds of bees in it. So those are two recommendations if you are looking for a book that you wanted to read during your free time right now. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, let me just say the um, planting guide is free as a PDF and we will get that shared with you. And I know the conservation district was planning on uh, ordering some too for print. So if people really um, prefer a print version or something, we can work something out. I'm sure we'll be taking them out on site visits later on in this year as well. But it's just a nice, easy, free link to go to all the time. Alrighty. Any other questions regarding lawns to legumes before we move on? It seems like we're good. <clears throat> okay, so we are going to be 
talking next about some of the major challenges that face our pollinators right now. <clears throat> Before we get into how can we help them. So one of the biggest ones that we're going to be talking about is loss of habitat. Um, so sorry, let me close some of these chat boxes here. Um, the map here that we see on the screen on the right is the pre-settlement vegetation in Minnesota around 1847. And this shows, you won't be able to read all the different plant communities, but this represents all the different native plant communities and our prairies are represented in yellow. And it looks like they're covering almost a third of the state. And then in red is our current native remnant prairies, which is, um, as you can see, extremely sparse and just located in a few areas, mostly in Western Minnesota. It's estimated that across the state, we've lost almost 98% of our original prairies. So that's a pretty, pretty staggering loss. And what has replaced those beautiful, beautiful tall grass prairies is monocultures. Um, and monoculture is just a very simplified version of a natural system. It's taken away all the redundancies, the feedback loops, and the diversity that really creates that resilience. And monocultures are very efficient at one thing, which is producing a lot of yield in a small amount of place. Um, or places to park in the case of impervious surfaces. So they're really not able to meet that demand of both food and habitat and ecosystem services, and it makes them harder to adapt to change. And then here is a more zoomed in map of the Twin Cities, and this shows our remaining native plant communities. This is not just the prairies. This includes some of the big wood ecosystems as well, but these are really those, um, those Ecosystem remnants identified by the Minnesota Biological Survey. As you can see, it's extremely sparse. It's mostly congregated here in northern Washington County. And again, um, our prairies and woodlands have been replaced with lawns, with parking lots, with corona crops and buildings. And these surfaces do create a lot of um, pollution with the runoff. Approximately 40% of Minnesota's waters are considered impaired and runoff from flooding also damages property. We're experiencing lack of tree cover, which in a warming climate isn't a great thing. And this lack of green space is also adversely affecting our own personal health and our communities. So all of these factors really need to be taken into account when um, considering how to make your property more resilient. Right, and uh, on top of taking away the native vegetation and replacing it with asphalt and grass and ornamental plantings. Um, we then maintain the, the, that, those, that, those parking lots, those lawns and ornamental plantings uh, with uh, things that do their job sometimes really well, sometimes too well, but do more than their job as well. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the systemic the family of insecticides neonicotinoids um, are great at treating, uh, you know, at fighting emerald ash borer. Um, they're also, uh, they can be, um, they, they can, they're used um, to protect crops from pest damage, um, but uh, they're, they, they have been introduced into ornamental plantings uh, at nurseries to protect uh, household garden plants from pest damage. And uh, the systemic nature of the pesticide means that um, it gets expressed in the um, flower uh, as well as every other part of the plant and um, gets taken up by beneficial insects as well as a pest. Um, most insecticides, they can't discriminate between the two. Um, and so limiting the use of insecticides is in, um, is important uh, for the rusty patch bumblebee and for other beneficial insects that um, you know bring uh, that help our economy for one with pollination um, and then also just help uh, form the fundamental building blocks of our ecosystems. Um, you know uh, what eats insects is birds. Um, the average, uh, I think, chickadee family in the spring of parents feed their brood uh, between they need three to six thousand caterpillars um, big juicy grubs full of 
you know, fat and protein, just what a little growing chick needs. Um, and those caterpillars feed on vegetation. Um, if, you know, we treat too many things with insecticides, uh, we don't get the birds that we want to see in our yards. Um, on the other side of that, our impervious surfaces get treated with salt in the winter, um, and that salt doesn't stay there. That runs off with the next melt into our bodies of water, contributing to the impairment that Lauren mentioned, um, and also harming our aquatic, aquatic insects. Um, speaking of runoff, uh, I want you to imagine with me the uh, trail that one raindrop might fall might experience as it falls from the sky and lands on the rooftop of this house. Um, if the house and the gutters all work correctly, um, it will not enter the house. It'll go down the downspout and be directed away from the foundation um, where it'll run over the lawn. Um, in the business, uh, we call lawns green concrete um, because they're not super great at infiltrating large amounts of water. Um, after a certain period, they act like impervious surface. Um, so that, rain, that raindrop will continue into the gutter, carrying with it everything that's picked up along the way, uh, chemicals applied to the lawn, um, et cetera, and then down into the storm drain, where uh, you know in those gutters, especially this time of year, full of gunk, uh, which is the technical term for it. Um, and that storm drain is what you see. What most people don't see is the other side of those, um, which empty unfiltered into, you know, usually the nearest downhill body of water. Um, this is where we want to impress on you that one teaspoon of salt permanently contaminates five gallons of water. Um, but on top of the pollutants that the rainwater brings, um, it also, uh, just the amount of runoff that gets generated is its own source of pollution. It can contribute to erosion along storm bank, stream banks. Um, and then uh, the last picture here as we follow the um, raindrop is a, a eutrophic lake. Um, full of uh, algae blooms due to all the nutrients that runoff has carried into the lake. Um, one pound of phosphorus uh, can bring, uh, can grow 500 pounds of algae. Um, and that phosphorus comes from, uh, uh, you know, rotting decaying matter as well as any fertilizers that have uh, a number in the K slot when you see the three numbers for the fertilizers. Um, so uh, as we talk about creating pollinator habitat, um, I promise that's what most of this workshop is going to be about, but we encourage you to think about um, the habitat that you can create, how it can have a greater impact than just helping pollinators. And one way to do that is to put it in a way um, or construct it in such a way that it can help intercept and infiltrate some of the stormwater runoff. Um, which is only going to get more important, uh, as you can see from this graph, last year's precipitation was off the charts. Um, uh, and with climate change, we expect to see um, increased uh, intensity and duration of storm events, uh, which means more rainfall, more runoff. Um, so the question is, uh, how do we respond to these challenges? Um, and we want you to leave this workshop feeling empowered. Uh, each individual uh, resident can play a role in rebuilding a network. No one person can do it alone, but all of us acting together can help construct a network of practices and uh, pollinator habitat that can um, start to address these challenges.
to stop again for some questions. Angie, did you see any questions coming up? I don't have my chat box open right now. Okay, one moment. I was trying to get a better answer to the question. Um, does the use of magnesium flakes have the same effect as using salt for de-icing? One moment, parking dog. Um, typically, the magnesium is also a type of salt, so it's a magnesium chloride mixture, so it does still add chloride into the environment. Um, the big difference is that sometimes something like a magnesium chloride might have a um, lower melting temperature, so you could use it when the pavement is colder, whereas the typical salt you can't use when the pavement's colder than 15 degrees, so that's the reason you sometimes see it recommended. But I'm going to mute myself again because the dog's not cooperating. Um. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I want to emphasize is that um, uh, we recognize that it's important for people to stay safe um, and that, you know, we can't stop, just flat stop applying salt to every road and every surface. Um, we encourage you, if possible, to shovel first. Um, I have an ice chipper uh, that you can um, chip away at kind of the, the harder uh, crusted on stuff. Um, and just kind of try to apply as little as possible. Um, it really doesn't take much salt to melt, um, you know, the average sidewalk frontage. Um, I forget the stat, but like a coffee mug covers almost 200 square feet, I think. No. Oh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> And then another thing is just a reminder for people too that you can sweep up the salt afterwards and use it again. Same thing with the sand. Just keep a bucket there. Keep reusing it. It'll save you money. And just a reminder too that if the ice and snow are already there, applying the salt afterwards isn't really effective. It really needs to have that contact with the concrete uh, in order to really get that. And then also always read those melting points like Angie said when picking the right de-icer. More is not always the answer. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I think that covers everything. All right, I think that means we get to move on to the to the fun fun part. Great. <laughs> fun. Creating the pollinator habitat. Right. Okay. So um, as we touched on before, pollinators need to be protected from pesticides. Um, they need uh, clean water sources. Uh, generally, a lot of that, a lot of uh, pollinators uh, get hydrated through the nectar they drink, uh, but especially in the warmest days, they might, might uh, rely on other water as well. Uh, staggered bloom times, flower resources throughout the season. Um, they need nesting sites. Um, we'll talk about it later, but uh, you know we mentioned the rusty patch bumblebee and all bumblebees are ground nesting. Um, but a significant portion of our state's uh, 450 plus native bee species nest in the uh, hollow and pithy stems of plants. Um, and others nest in um, cavities and uh, kind of little crevices that they find. Um, so a uh, variety of nesting sites is important to support a variety of bees. And then lastly, again, this network of habitat and protected refuge areas. Um, what does that look like and why is that so important? Um, this on the left here is a map of Minneapolis with the high quality areas as identified uh, through um, kind of satellite GIS imagery um, highlighted in dark green. Um, when you add a 200 meter buffer, which is the distance that our smallest pollinators can fly, um, you can see that there's a lot of islands um, here, which would mean isolated, uh, fragmented habitats that probably couldn't support populations long-term. Um, and even larger um, areas are still disconnected from each other. Um, now, uh, this map on the furthest right is not 
all of the great native habitat in the city. Um, it's just a very small fraction of it. It's the um, rain gardens and native plantings that Metro Blooms has installed and we've had reported through our workshops. Um, but you can see with just that small fraction alone, um, these uh, small residential scale projects are beginning to stitch together the fabric of the city such that um, pollinators can fly from one side to the other they um, can access resources all around. Um, and by connecting what is otherwise fragmented habitat, um, we allow for species that are more sensitive to fragmented habitat, including our friend, the Rusty Patch. Um, now, uh, as a kind of touchdown with the runoff, um, one other thing we want to uh, kind of emphasize is that the pollinator habitat you put in your yard can do so much more than just uh, feed bees. Um, if you place flowering trees and shrubs on the um, kind of west, west side of your house, um, they can provide shade in the um, late afternoon in the summer and uh, cool and uh, reduce your energy costs for cooling. Uh, rain gardens, as mentioned, can uh, reduce the amount of uh, runoff that gets sent to our local bodies of water. Um, and healthy soil um, supports, you know, everything growing in it as well as sequesters carbon um, and improves the infiltration rate of, uh, of rain gardens and other practices. All right, so um, one of the first things that we want people to really be thinking of before they just dive into going to the store and picking out all these fun plants is to really assess their own yard and think about where is that potential habitat um, and where is it best placed. And so um, we recommend even just going in Google Maps and zooming in on your house and printing out to get out a Sharpie or something like that and start drawing. Um, and it's always best, I always like to start by marking off the impervious surfaces, the place that I know I'm not going to be able to transform. So I'm going to outline my roof, outline my driveway, um, any patios or just hard, hard spaces. And then I'm going to start looking at um, what's currently existing, marking up the areas that are currently lawn. Where are my garden beds? Where are my trees? Um, you know, are they located in more shady areas, sunny areas? Um, and also just challenging everyone to think about the functionality of this too. I know right now I'm looking outside and I can see part of my lawn and I can tell you that I never use this front part here ever and this would probably be the first place that I would start thinking about converting and that would actually provide some real habitat. And then lastly thinking about drainage, um, talking about how we can kind of get those layered benefits of both habitat and water quality. Where is the water going on our property? Um, this is pretty easy to figure out if you have downspouts or gutters. You can kind of see where it's directed. Um, but if you don't, even just on a rainy day, kind of look out your window and see where it's collecting. I know some of you are immediately thought of that kind of soggy spot in your backyard um, that some of you might not notice because it pretty quickly goes to the street. Um, so that's another important thing that I encourage people to think about. Um, and then they can think about how can I intercept that water on the way from my roof to the street and hopefully collect some of it. Um, and this is something that, again, we really encourage everyone to do. You don't need to be a professional to do this, um, but if you have a site visit with a conservation district, or if you're in Minneapolis or something, you have it with Metro Blooms, um, there are people who are able to walk through this process with you and come out on your property. And right now, I don't know exactly when that is, um, but even if it's a virtual site visit, um, we're happy to figure that out with you. Um, John, do you want me to keep going from here? I'm going to keep going for a second. Sure. Yeah. Right. First time presenting together, we kind of switched off from someone else, but pretty smoothly so far. Um, so why native plants? We kind of have touched on this many times, um, but they provide lots of habitats for more than just um, pollinators. Um, there's a lot of species here that have co-evolved with these plants um, and need them for their habitat, for their food. Um, and really depend on them. 
Um, they're well adapted to Minnesota's environment, so they require fewer inputs. There's a reason how we always talk about native plants being low maintenance. Um, they're adapted, so they're currently fine with the amount of rain that they get from the sky. Um, they're fine with the soil types here. They don't need added fertilizers or anything like that. Um, and again, the biggest part that we're going to drive home is those really awesome long roots that are going to help us um, soak up that water and help infiltrate so they have a huge water quality benefit as well. So again, just reminding people, it's not just, not just our wonderful butterflies, it's also our, our birds too and our bats and our mammals. Um, so this is a pretty awesome image here um, of the different roots of native prairie plants. And if you look on the far left of the screen, we have turf lawn grass and the average root for that is about three inches. I believe they usually say that it's about a little awesome. Um, usually it's about the roots are as long as um, the grass is tall. So if you're constantly cutting your grass really, really short, you're encouraging a shorter root growth actually. So that's one of our tips later is to let your grass grow longer. Um, but as you kind of scan over here to the right, we have all sorts of different native plants here. Um, I believe one of these, maybe this next one over is the lead plant, which can have roots up to 20 feet long. So why are these really long roots really special is that they really help break up the soil. And as these plants grow every year and those roots die off, they actually leave this negative space in the soil, slowly decompacting it, which again allows for improved infiltration. Um, and you can see here just to that compacted soil really limits the ability for these plants or just any plants really to grow. Um, it can become waterlogged and anaerobic. It really doesn't foster good root growth. So that's another reason to focus on the soil health as well. Just putting plants in the ground isn't going to solve things. You have to think about what are you putting on there and remembering that soil is alive and treating it like something is alive too. So um, we can talk about compost and all the amazing ways that can help as well. Um, and also thinking about soil type as well. So we'll get into that later, but when we're picking our plants, I really encourage everyone, if you've never just gone in your yard and taken a trowel and really felt your soil, then the little ribbon test to find out if you have sandy soil or clay soil or loam, um, that can be really telling for you. And the U of M actually even does soil tests, I believe for less than $15 where you can send them the sample and it will even tell you, you know, what deficiencies your soil has, um, you know, what is the balance of it, and that can be really helpful for um, picking that habitat and those plants in the future. Okay, um, so now we're going to talk about four different kinds of pollinator habitat that you can fit in your yard. Um, there are other ways that you can increase pollinator habitat. There are other uh, ways that you can make your yard more sustainable. This is not an exclusive list, um, but these four uh, projects are what Bowser is uh, reimbursing for um, in their individual cost share grants. Um, and it's also kind of the four types that they are um, promoting uh, in the planting guide and the other resources that they're pushing out there. Um, they're doing this for a few reasons. Uh, they they kind of chose uh, these four options. They believe there's something here for everyone, um, and they've ranked them from uh, highest priority, what they believe has the chance to be the best impact for the kind of smallest uh, cost, uh, whether cost is, you know, money or elbow grease, um, to um, kind of the um, as, as they go down the list, it's kind of like, they're still really beneficial. And when you get to pollinator meadows, I mean, they're clearly far and away the biggest bang you can do, but Bowser is uh, more cautious about promoting that because it's not as simple to do. Um, so the first one that we wanna talk about, the one that um, you know anybody could do is, almost anybody could do, is a native, plant pocket, native plant pocket planting. Um, there's room in almost every yard for one. Even uh, 10 feet by 10 feet uh, is enough to fit 100 plants in there if you plant them at one foot per square foot, one plant per square foot. Um, to install a native pocket planting is um, pretty simple. 
uh, it's ideally small enough you could just uh, use a shovel and dig it out, um, or you could sheet mulch over most uh, turf or plants and kind of create a planting bed that way. Um, you'll see in a video in a few slides a sod kicker, uh, which is a device that we use when we um, uh, rip out sod and put in native plants. Um, it's a nice workout. Uh, no need to, well, I guess no one's <laughs> going to the gym right now. Um, and we all might need a little bit of a workout after sitting around so long. So uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, you know, uh, getting out there and moving some dirt around might be just the thing to do. Um, couple things about the native pocket planting. The uh, templates that I touched on earlier um, are kind of ideas of native pocket plantings. Uh, when you design them and put them, uh, when you plan them out, uh, you want to think about getting the taller plants towards the middle or back of the garden so that you can see them all. Um, and you want to consider massing the plants, the like plants together. Um, not only does it help you if you've got three or four coneflower side by side that you can identify them, you know they belong, um, but it also helps bees find them. Uh, I, I've learned from um, our resident entomologist, James Wolfen, that um, bees' uh, first the primary sense uh, of navigating the world is um, through their sense of smell, um, especially when they're far away from a garden and they're uh, looking for food. Um, stronger signals of mast plantings are going to be better for them and easier to find than um, different plants uh, scattered around a garden. Um, and then it also helps signal intent. Uh, you know, some uh, native plants get a, a kind of a idea that they uh, are really unruly and wild, um, and they can be, uh, but we can work with them uh, and kind of uh, plan for some, uh, you know, intention in the garden by uh, massing and putting in drifts like plants together. Um, now that's, oh, intention, great. <laughs> um, the other way that we can show intention as well as reduce uh, weed infiltration into the garden and plants escaping out of the garden, if those are concerns of yours, is by using edging. Um, we have displayed on the screen a variety of edges uh, that you could rely on, um, you know, stone edges, brick, uh, cut right into the sod, um, or, uh, you know, landscaping uh, that's already there, like sidewalks or the um, retaining wall. Um, but uh, edges are your friend. Um, now that's a native pocket planting. I'm going to quickly run through a couple of variations on it. Um, variation one is a rain garden which is basically a pocket planting with a um, lowered middle, um, uh, flat bottom, uh, and then you have sides that are gently sloped and help channel runoff to the bottom where it collects and then uh, efficiently infiltrates through the soil. Um, constructing one is uh, kind of beyond the scope of this workshop, but really quick, I'm gonna show you a video of how easy it can be. Um, you start out by knowing where you're gonna do it, laying out the garden, and then using that sod kicker you can see them use uh, to remove the sod and rolls um, is how we did it. Um, you measure out the basin, which is generally 18 inches in from the edge for a six inch basin. Um, remove the dirt. If you can find somewhere on site to put that dirt, that's great. Uh, generally, you know, against a foundation that might be settling, uh, making sure you have positive drainage away from your foundation is always nice. Otherwise, building a berm or something um, 
reducing the amount of soil you have to take off-site reduces the carbon costs of the whole venture. Um, once you've dug and shaped the garden, you want to cover it with mulch. Um, and you want to mulch it before you lay out the plants because that reduces compaction. Uh, you know, Lauren touched on uh, how compaction can limit the effectiveness of this garden as well as the ability of these plants to grow and thrive. Um, then after it's mulched, you want to lay out the plants and once they're laid out and you like where they are and spaced, you water them, or sorry, you plant them and then you water them. I'm a little slower than the video, uh, but uh, you can see it's just that simple. Um, that is a rain garden. Uh, variation B uh, is a boulevard for anyone who has uh, space between their street and sidewalk. Um, oftentimes that generally mounds up and uh, a whole, it can create big puddles in the sidewalk. Um, and it also limits uh, tree growth uh, in the boulevard because it, it doesn't get all the uh, irrigation that it would from rain soaking into the boulevards. Um, uh, if you have a boulevard, uh, you could consider uh, removing some of the fill there, um, shaping it uh, below grade of the sidewalk and curb, um, and then filling it uh, either with uh, salt tolerant turf grass that can take the impact of uh, our uh, salting in the winters. It ends up getting pretty much everywhere, uh, especially the boulevards, um, or a variety of native plants that are hardy. Um, this is a picture of uh, Fragaria vesca, woodland strawberry, um, that we have planted in the boulevard and is uh, thriving. Um, if you do any work in boulevards, check with your city. Um, they are generally city property and you may need a special permit. Um, oh, last thing about boulevards, think about height requirements. Um, keep it below two to three feet. Um, again, your city might have strict requirements, but for safety reasons, we can't be hiding uh, anybody on the sidewalk from anybody on the street. Because, um, you know, kids are short and they go places they shouldn't. Um, variation C. Um, is you could do a small native planting on a lake shore, um, which is a great place to uh, put in a, a kind of lake shore buffer. Um, the one thing you want to keep in mind about planting on your lake shore is that you'll find different zones uh, as you move further from the lake uh, up the shore. Um, different kinds of plants will thrive based on how wet they like their feet or roots. Um, so uh, you'll want to plan for wetter loving plants uh, close to the lake and then drier loving plants further up. All right, sorry, I had to unmute real quick. Um, also for the shoreline part two, if you have never been to the DNR Restore Your Shore site. That's a really great website to go to. They have a bunch of great resources and they have a tool um, kind of similar to what Bluefem has where you can enter in your site conditions and then it will create a list for you of your shoreline species and create it by zone that um, emergent species, your wet meadow and your prairie. And I use that tool all the time to send things to landowners. It's extremely comprehensive, but it's a good place to just start if you're trying to think um, what are some of those species that might make things a little wetter. Um, so the second category of pollinator plantings that you can do in your yard include planting pollinator beneficial trees and shrubs. And one of the reasons that this is really important for our bumblebees is that like John was talking about before, the rusty patch bumblebees are coming out in April. And as you're looking around, there's not a ton of things blooming on the ground yet, but our trees are starting to bloom. Like our basswoods, um, some of our cherry trees, and these provide the maximum amount of foraging in a small amount of area. Because um, when these bumblebees, specifically the queens, are emerging from the ground, they're very hungry and they need a lot of energy, that pollen and nectar right away. 
in order for them to be able to go out and find their nest and be able to start their colony. So just for a few weeks, they need to really, you know, kind of bulk up on food so they can just go from blossom to blossom to blossom in the tree and really efficient, very forage very efficiently. So this is kind of a comprehensive list. I won't read everything. Um, but again, the big ones that we think of for trees are the basswoods. Um, the dogwoods are amazing. Um, things in the, you know, the cherry tramp family with their plums, apples, willows, um, pussy willows are wonderful. And then so many shrubs. And I love that a lot of these are edible too, which I think is kind of fun um, if you're into an edible native landscape. Um, you know, black chokeberry, elderberry. Um, your dwarf bush honeysuckle is a great one if you kind of have a shady spot in your yard and you're looking for something a little bit lower. Um, yeah, again, a lot of these, you got to think about site specifics, but there are a lot of different ways that you can increase flowering resources in your yard that aren't just forbs. A lot of us kind of forget about our, our shrubs. Viburnums are wonderful too. Um, another big thing to think about with our trees and shrubs is to think about them in layers in our yard. And so we want to think about our canopy, our mid-story, and our kind of shrub layer. And so you can see in this bottom picture here, they've used this birch. And the birch is actually kind of the mid-story. And then they have these large pines here um, in the canopy or over a story. And then there's different shrubs on the ground. So there's different places where you can create that layering. And that will also be really beneficial for birds and other creatures as well. And um, it's also great too, if you're thinking about how to be a little more energy efficient on your property, this is a great way to kind of get those layered benefits. And trees are also wonderful for um, intercepting stormwater as it comes down at well and they can capture a lot just within their leaves and not just even considering their root systems. And I have a quick example for um, local to Washington County of some landowners I worked with down in Cottage Grove. I just wanted to include a few project examples um, of people that we worked with and that took advantage of some of our cost share opportunities and kind of what were the design considerations. So um, this property owner here kind of had a large area around their yard that had a beautiful old oak, over, oak overstory and underneath they had a lot of different invasives, mostly buckthorn. Um, I believe they had some prickly ash as well and some of the different invasive honeysuckles. And they were really interested in removing those and increasing the diversity within their site, providing some um, late season blooms as well in addition to early, and then really thinking about the shade and then privacy as well. So don't worry about reading all this text here, but this is just the plan that I submitted to them. And what I really want people to take note of is that we did things in phases. Um, a lot of times people get excited and try to bite off more than they can chew. And if you've ever started <laughs> removing buckthorn, you know how big of a battle it is. So instead of telling them to go through all at once, I encourage them to find the area in the property where things were ready to plant, which in this case was that southeastern area. And so we came up with a nice mix that featured those dwarf bush honeysuckles, choke cherry, hazelnuts, downy airwood, and some other um, forbs, including some really nice early flowering species. A lot of our woodland species are. Um, and then over on that western side, I really encourage them to start flagging those native species that they saw coming up to kind of protect them and keep, you know, weeding around them, encouraging them to grow and making sure those get some light. A lot of them had just been suppressed um, by some of the invasive species. And then slowly start phasing it out um, so they can maintain their screening on that side and start planting those native plants, which is where I have to plug the WCD tree sale, which is a great place to get some of these flowering trees and shrubs. Unfortunately, our tree sale pickup is happening at the end of the month, um, but the tree sale goes live every year in about November. We have an online ordering system. There's also a paper order form that goes on as well, but if you're looking for a very cost-effective way to plant trees on your property and do a large restoration project, you can get a bundle of 25 trees for 35 bucks these are going to be small, about three foot bare root seedlings, so you're not going to get that instant impact or privacy, but it's just a really good way to get some native plants. We get most of them from the DNR and other ones from Schumacher's, which is a wholesale plant nursery, but these were some of the big habitat species that we always saw a lot of, and oaks are one of the biggest ones. Angie has a fun fact, but I forgot how many different, I think it's something crazy of how many different species a single oak, fir oak specifically, can provide. Here, 
are 519 species of larval insects that live on the oaks. And those are the, uh, the baby insects. You might think of them less glamorously as maggots and such, caterpillars, things like that, but that's what the birds love to eat. Yes, so different layered benefits there too. And John was talking about, you know, the birds need to eat and then those other things need to eat plants. So we have to think about all stages of that, of wildlife. So we're gonna head over to pollinator lawns. All right, um, so pollinator lawns is our third type of project. Uh, for those of you who are following along, uh, first priority, uh, native pocket plantings. Second priority, uh, pollinator trees and shrubs. Uh, Lauren put it perfectly when uh, she said uh, they provide such a great burst of early season forage to bees. Um, they're also very uh, generally simple to install and, uh, and maintain. And so Bowser chose that specifically because um, for folks who were afraid of having to maintain um, uh, planting. Um, it's really easy to not pull out the one tree you want to keep um, as opposed to, you know, identifying uh, between uh, 10 or 20 different plants. Um, for the third option, pollinator lawns, um, uh, this option is kind of for the folks who um, want to keep a uh, kind of a, a lawn area, um, but are okay with it not looking picture perfect in the sense that we in America have come to define as uh, uniformly cut and uh, one shade of green uh, without any other uh, strangers or diversity uh, in the lawn. Um, so uh, pollinator lawns are a great fit for the people who are open to that. Um, they're composed of generally fine fescues, uh, which are a, a native species of grass that's slower growing, so it needs uh, fewer inputs, uh, both uh, fertilizer and it doesn't need to be mowed as much. Um, and then a variety of low growing forbs that have been shown to feed our struggling pollinators. Um, uh, Turf alternatives um, can help reduce uh, the inputs that you put on your lawn through, you know, reduced mowing requirements. Uh, fescues have longer roots, so you don't need to water them as much. Um, you won't need to fertilize them as much. Um, so they can also improve, because of those longer roots, improve infiltration. Um, and then uh, with the uh, low growing flowers in the lawn too. We're starting to make our lawn serve more than us, starting to serve the ecosystem again and bring back food and habitat to uh, pollinators. Um, some even think that having flowers in your lawn is pretty. I don't know. I'll leave that up to you. Um, so uh, what would that look like? Um, first, uh, let me run over. Uh, Right here, you can see, here you can see, um, this is just kind of a fine fescue lawn. Um, it's oftentimes called low mow or no mow uh, grass mix. Um, and it can grow up to six inches. You can mow it as little as two times a year. Um, it kind of does this like wavy ocean thing um, when it gets tall. You know, you might have ordinances or a homeowner regulations that don't allow you to leave your grass grow that tall. Um, uh, in the middle we have violets uh, which haven't been shown to specifically help the russy patch but um, are a host species for um, other um, native uh, insects. Um, and over on the right here we have uh, what we're going to talk about uh, next and how to install them is a pollinator lawn. You can see the white tufts of Dutch white clover um, and then the purple self heel and uh, there could be some creeping thyme in there as well. Um, now uh, if you uh, want a pollinator lawn it is fairly simple to recreate in your yard. 
um, as long as your yard isn't already um, kind of overflown with aggressive invasives like creeping Charlie that will um, kind of take advantage of what you're going to do to it. Uh, you can, uh, you don't have to remove everything. Um, uh, you can just start by mowing your lawn as short as possible, um, you know, below one inch if you can, um, and then rake the clippings. Uh, this stresses the lawn so that, um, you know, it kind of like, it, it, so that your existing Kentucky bluegrass or whatever kind of um, grass you have, um, you know, won't just bound back super quickly. And by exposing the soil, you're going to improve the uh, seed to soil contact that you make when you spread your fescue, clover, um, creeping thyme, and self-heal seeds. Um, spreading those seeds is aided by a bulking agent like compost or sand. Um, after you spread them, uh, you want to keep the area moist until uh, you see sprouts, um, and then cut back on watering, making sure that, um, especially, uh, you know, as they're really young and fragile, um, you do keep an eye on them. Um, and you can uh, also reduce fertilizing. Uh, then how to maintain these is pretty simple. Uh, we would recommend you never again mow below three inches. Um, like Lauren said, we say grass grows about its roots grow about as deep as it grows high. So if you're mowing your lawn constantly at one and a half or two inches, you're really limiting the amount of roots that it can develop. Um, especially with a pollinator lawn and the um, clover and other forbs in it, um, they are going to rely on, um, you know, three, three and a half inches maybe when you, you see a big bloom of flowers. Um, let them get a little bit long. We, we recommend always practice a rule of one thirds, only cut off, unless you're trying to stress your lawn, um, only cut off a third of, mo only mow a third of your lawn off at a time. So if you cut down to three, you can let it go to four and a half and then back. Um, then, uh, oops, sorry. Um, and then lastly, I want to remind you, a lot of herbicides have been chosen to remove uh, Dutch white clover and other weeds from your lawn. Um, these flowers are what add the floral diversity and forage that over 50 species of uh, bees native to Minnesota have been, you know, seen using on bee lawns. Um, so, when you've gone through all the work of getting them installed, um, then if you see any weeds that you don't want in your lawn, uh, consider removing them by hand. Thanks. Um, and I'll mention too that the Conservation District just installed um, a bee lawn on their property this past fall, so it's just coming up using the um, installation methods that John just outlined. We kind of recognized that there wasn't a lot of great um, examples in Washington County for people to drive by and see and it's definitely not at the level John just pictured yet but we're hoping in the coming years in this growing season it really will start to be um, and we also have some resources to get signs for your yard if you're planning on installing one and you don't want your neighbors to say you know what the heck are the what the Johnson's doing um, we can help print out a sign for you that will educate people on what a flowering bee lawn is so um, let me know if you need one of those. So that last section that we're going to go to is a pollinator meadow. Um, this is the last category, like John said, just because it can be a little intimidating. Um, it's a little more involved, but we also just want you to think of it um, as just a lot of different pocket plantings put together to make one larger planting of diverse native plants. Um, as you can see here, they chose to do this in a big swath of their boulevard here. Um, and another way this can look in Washington County, maybe in a more rural area, is a larger um, prairie project, which we've helped people install before. So another project example, and this one happened in Stillwater with the help of a Browns Creek Watershed District grant. I should mention that the last one was a South Washington District grant for the Woodland property. Um, 
this was a one acre property um, and there was only one person here who was doing the maintenance and this was a lot of mowing for this person here. That pond there actually um, drains directly to the Browns Creek so that was a really critical resource that we wanted to protect. As you can imagine all those grass clippings were probably going straight in the pond and down into Browns Creek so that was something that we were hoping to stop. And she was um, also hoping to create a planting that would address that transition from a dry to wet and then she just said color, color, color. So that was something that we wanted to help her do. She really wanted to see a lot of pollinators and birds coming back to her lawn. So it was finally able to be transformed into this wow. whole diverse planting. Um, we have that Menarda, the bee balm right in front there and some false sunflower. There was swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed. It was um, a really gorgeous property. Um, I will say though that this was not a project that was done with a sod cutter or just nice um, by hand. This was something that was done with a restoration company that they you know, hired a contractor. This involved several seasons of mowing and burning, some herbicide use, um, tilling it up, and a really careful consideration of the seed mixes here. These seed mixes for these native species, especially really high quality local ecotypes, meaning you're sourcing your seed from within about a 50 mile radius. They're not cheap and you wanna make sure that they, um, those flowers actually come up. So you need to really do your research with the site prep. And in order to be able to do that effectively, um, a lot of people just don't have access to some of those larger equipment. Um, so that's really where cost share grants can come in. So if this project identified with you and your property, let me know. Um, you know, this, there are other grants available through the state level for um, spreading larger areas of turf or even ag. So again, this is something that we'd want to talk about at a site visit and go into more detailed design process. But this is doable and this is doable within one to two years as well. So, but obviously you're looking at a very different cost and a very different timeline than your pocket planting, but um, still very attainable. And of course, as you can imagine, you're gonna see thousands and thousands of you know, bugs and everything buzzing around here. So you're really getting the highest quality habitat here. So this was just a huge benefit to her neighbors and she actually inspired two other people on her street to convert about an acre of um, prairie as well. So that was pretty cool. So I'll quick breeze through this again. It's just gonna be a bite by bite, bite by bite process, similar to some of the other installation steps. This could be done by um, a sheet mulching process, solarization where you're covering with a plastic and letting it sit on there. You're digging it into the soil and you're letting the sun kind of bake your grass over the course of the growing season and killing it. Um, or it could be a process of cultivation or something like that. Kind of depends on what your existing vegetation is. Um, I could really spend a lot of time talking about these different site prep methods for these larger properties. Um, but I'd really encourage all of you to refer to the Xerxes Guide for Organic Site Preparation. This is a really fantastic guide. Xerxes Society is a wonderful organization. It does a lot of research on um, pollinator conservation um, and helps people do these restorations. So I will send out this guide with the follow-up email, but it really does a great job of laying out some of the pros and cons of each of these site prep methods. So, um, and then moving on, so you have picked out your project, you have your plants, you're ready to install. So we're gonna be talking really quick about maintenance. And so plant establishment, it's really important that when you first get your plants in the ground that you're watering them, especially during the dry periods. Um, until you see a little bit of growth. We're talking about at least an inch per week. If you have an irrigation system and you're not sure if they're getting an inch per week, you can put out something like a tuna can and let it sit there for the duration of your period and then check and see if it's overflowing, you've got more than an inch and you can probably dial it back. Um, another big thing during the growing season is that we want to make sure we're pulling those weeds, especially when those plants are starting to establish um, and giving them room to grow. We're keeping the plantings clear of debris and then we're replacing mulch in the plants as, we, as needed. Um, this could look like using existing plants and just dividing them. It could look like collecting seed in the fall and planting that. And I think there's just a very compelling image on the bottom of the small, very small Siberian elm seedling on the far left and then the mature tree on the right. And just kind of reminding you of 
how quickly those can grow and really reminding you which one of those would you rather pull. I think most people would agree it's the one on the left. So um, it's really just staying on top of that weeding, especially in the growing season. Um, an easy kind of benchmark for people to um, focus on would be the three major holidays, which would be Memorial Day, July 4th, and Labor Day. So kind of beginning, middle, end of summer, you're kind of checking in on your garden at those points. That's kind of a good way to make sure that you're on top of maintenance. Um, again, not going to go into everything again. You're, again, you're pulling those weeds. You're dividing and transplanting at this point since it's the growing season. Um, do a little bit of inspection too. See maybe where there's some mildew growing on your plants or there's some stunted growth. Maybe something isn't happy, especially in rain gardens. I really encourage people to get in there and inspect because maybe your rain garden isn't draining properly. And if that happens, you're going to see a lot of issues with your plants. And usually it's a pretty simple fix, um, but you want to address it early on because that was a big investment on your part. And then in spring, right, right now, um, we're kind of waiting to cut back those plants until the average temp is about 50. We're getting really, really close because right now all of those um, bees that we were talking about that live in those stems are just starting to emerge. And so we wanna give them time to get out before we cut everything back. Um, John, did you have anything to add about the growing season maintenance for pollinators that maybe I didn't hit on there? Um, yeah, just I, I wanna uh, reiterate the importance of the importance of when you cut uh, your hollow and pithy stems back. Um, uh, we really recommend uh, if you can, if you're afraid of how it looks, maybe, you know, in the back of the garden or in your backyard, um, just leave 15 to 18 inches of the stem um, still, you know, from the ground to about knee level. Um, and then those uh, dead hollow and pithy stems are ideal nesting sites for next year's or for, I guess, this year's bees to lay eggs so that next year's bees can emerge from them. Um, so it is like a multi-year process, right? The bees emerge one year, they lay the eggs that come out the next. So the stems need to remain in place for a while. Mm -hmm. so, uh, sometimes in our gardens at the office, we kind of identify a little refuge area like John was talking about an area that we're not really too concerned about aesthetically that we have always made sure that no one goes through with the weed whipper or at most if they do, like you said, we keep it at 18 inches and it's just kind of um, our one consistent spot that we always have up and know that um, it's there and it's where most of our pithy plants are. Um, so in the fall, most of our maintenance is gonna be focusing on cleaning up some of those excess leaves we see in the garden. Maybe you can mulch them and use them other areas. Um, some people put them on their, their lawns for free pump, uh, fertilizer. Um, if you're into seed collection, this is a good time of year to do that. You can start collecting those dried seeds and saving them um, and start uh, germinating those next year. This is fall and winter is a good time to trim um, and prune your shrubs because it doesn't put as much stress on them. Please do not do that in spring or summer if you can avoid it. Um, and then again, like John said, just leave that plant death up, that dead material. Um, even if it's just about a third of your garden and making sure it's up throughout the next year so that those plants have time to emerge in the spring. And just kind of a fun fact is that um, goldenrod, which is a really popular and important late season bloomer for pollinators, is often blamed as being the source of allergies in the fall. And it's really not goldenrod at all. Goldenrod is a fantastic native species. It is um, ragweed that is to blame. So this is a really common weed that we see that time of year that's blooming. Um, it's kind of got that low rosette, but it's got a nice easy taproot that's pretty easy to pull. Um, and it's fairly easy to manage with mowing as well. So before you were hesitant about um, planting goldenrod, remember that it's probably ragweed that's giving you those problems. Um, cover most of this again in the winter we're leaving things up it also just adds interest most of us just want something pretty to look at in the winter I know I do I think I love seeing those little snow-capped comb flowers and um, I think those are really cute um, it's also important habitat obviously and provide some insulation as well um, and so some of those common examples of those plants with the pithy and hollow stems include our comb flowers a lot of our perennial grasses um, thinking of our, our big blue stems, Indian grass, 
Um, bone saw is a big one. They have those really nice like square stems. Um, mountain mint, goldenrod, or asters, Joe pie weed, and even hostas. So John, I'm gonna quick pass this on to you for what are the next steps for lawns to legumes? Okay, all right. So um, if I've uh, done my job correctly, uh, you should be excited to apply for a uh, lawns to legumes grant. Um, even though you are, and I will be honest, uh, statistically unlikely to get it. The more applications we get, the more uh, kind of interest we can demonstrate, bring back to the state and say, hey, we want to expand this program and help everyone who applied um, help the bees and convert part of their lawn to pollinator habitat. Um, so you can find more information about applying at bluethumb.org. Um, or on uh, uh, Bowser's site, which is uh, kind of long, but if you search Bowser Lawns to Legumes, it's right up there. I'll put it in the chat. Um, next, um, just like that example uh, with the uh, pollinator meadows, um, now is a, <laughs> well, I guess we're not talking with our neighbors all that much, um, but we hope that you can take what you've learned today um, and your passion for helping pollinators create habitat um, and share that with others. Um, you know, uh, we can only educate so many people. Uh, we need you to do some of that work too. Um, you don't need to be experts, um, but hopefully, you know, you'll have some resources in hand and you can point people to where they can go to get their questions answered. Um, just being an advocate for the idea that a yard doesn't have to be just a manicured, uh, flat, expansive green um, is a you know a wonderful thing. Um, and then lastly, uh, start planning uh, what you're going to do this spring. Um, that is uh, the four big steps. Yeah, and then just really quick again, we're going to be sending out a lot of these links afterwards, but. Just wanted to highlight some of the resources specifically for people in Washington County since that is the audience that we advertise this to. Um, so the one of the big ones is signing up for a free site visit with the Conservation District. If you don't live in Washington County, you're in Anoka, Ramsey, or Dakota, um, check in with your Conservation Districts too. They all have their own policies for how they do site visits, but um, you are not, you're not um, left empty-handed if you do not live in Washington County. But this is a free resource for all of our residents. Um, and right now we're kind of slowly figuring out um, how to do this in COVID time, um, but we still hope that people would sign up and we'll be in contact with you for how to get site visits started. Um, and that's really how we ask people to start the process if they wanna start a grant, which is really the next opportunity for cost share. Um, we are pretty experienced in helping people install a lot of different projects and can match them with cost share grants at the state level or from the local watersheds. Um, but the best way that we can do that is to go out and see your property and talk with you about what are those goals that you, you have for how you see your property and helping conserve natural resources. And lastly, if you aren't familiar already, I really encourage you guys to get to know your local watershed district. So your local watershed districts are another great educational resource. Um, if you're also passionate about improving water quality, they have different opportunities for cost share again. Um, and they're just another level of local government that you guys should get to know because they're pretty awesome and we partner with them a lot. So um, that's something you can uh, figure out how to do on our website is to find your watershed. Here's a quick map of the watersheds. Um, this one was going to be in Woodbury. So this technically is co-sponsored by the Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District. So there's eight in Washington County, which is really unique. There's really not anywhere in the state where you're going to see this level of um, this many watersheds all in one place. Um, but that just means there's a lot of different resources here in Washington County. So um, we can help figure out which watershed you're in and how to connect you there. And lastly, normally this is the time of year where I'd say get ready to go to the landscape revival, but some of them have been postponed or um, rescheduled, but it's still something to keep on your calendar. Landscape Revival is this wonderful native plant expo and market that happens every year where all these different growers from around the state come together 
and different educational resources. And it's just everything native plants and really great because a lot of our native plant suppliers are a little distance away from the Twin Cities. So it's kind of a one-stop shop to go from different native plant suppliers and get what you need. Ask questions, talk to the growers. They're so knowledgeable and they love to meet you guys. Um, but this next one for Oakdale is gonna be in September 19th. And believe it or not, fall um, can still be a good time to establish native plants. So don't worry if you're saying that seems like a terrible time of year, it still works. Dormant plantings can actually be pretty, pretty effective. And then if you're interested in going to the one in Shoreview, just stay tuned and go to the St. Paul Audubon website. They'll have more information on that. And lastly, we're just in a really great hotspot for native plants here. Wild Ones is a local nonprofit. And every year um, they create this really nice pamphlet that goes through all the different local plant nurseries in the area. Um, you'll be able to find this later again, we'll have the link. But I just wanted to highlight that in this corner here of the Metro, we just really have a wide diversity of plant suppliers here. So we are very lucky. And the reason I would say to use one of these nurseries is that you know that these plants have not been treated with any sort of in these systemic insecticides. You know that they're gonna be locally sourced and that they're actually going to be that um, native ecotype and you don't have to re triple read the label and making sure you're not getting a cultivar of a coneflower and they're just awesome um, local businesses to support as well. Of course I'm not allowed to be biased because I work for government. So um, in conclusion we're just kind of really leaving you with a message of hope. Uh, like John said before we really want to empower all of you to remember that Together with all these little different pocket plantings, we can create one awesome corridor of habitat. Um, so really don't, we don't want you to be overwhelmed. This can be easy. There are a lot of different things you can do in your, large, your yard and a lot of different resources. Um, and know that you're not alone. Look around, there's probably a lot of people. Just look around in this chat room even, there's 26 different people here who all showed up tonight and said, I wanna know more about how I can help pollinators. So connect with people in this room. This is a great place to get started and connect with people in your community. And to remember to take a big deep breath and remember you can start small. Those small interventions can make a huge difference as well. Um, and, you know, turning a turf yard into a place that provides habitat. So really anybody who's leaving here today should leave with a few different messages. And I think the biggest one is that this is doable. Stagger bloom times bite by bite pocket plantings and everybody has room to do those things so and we are excited to help you do those. John did you have any last encouraging messages of hope that I might have missed? Um, I, th I think you you hit the highlights perfectly Lauren. Um, I do want to uh, yeah uh, before we get to any questions um, I do want to thank everyone who um, spent uh, what arguably is the first beautiful evening of spring uh, here with us. Um, uh, and, you know, it's, it's been an interesting time. It's been a difficult time. Um, and uh, seeing the kind of response that we get and the, um, the people who are excited uh, to uh, start work on this uh, is um, really kind of really gratifying. Um, so I want to, uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all. <laughs>